but I think, look, this is an incredibly important moment uh, in Europe, and not just in Europe. Um, I think since the election of Syriza um, and the rise of Podemos in Spain, uh, there is a, a, f a feeling, suddenly an openness, that we can reject this agenda. And the whole world is really, um, you know, on this, this attempt to say no. And here we have this incredibly uh, anti-democratic, um, uh, ugly attempt to override the decisions of, of, of the people in Greece and to make an example out of Greece, right? To say, if you try to choose another road than austerity, uh, no matter what kind of democratic mandate you attempt, things will be worse for you. We will punish you for it. So this is not just about Greece, although I care deeply about Greece, and if it were only about Greece, it would matter. But it's not just about Greece. This is about, this is about Spain. This is about Portugal. Uh, this is about Italy, the fact that this has reawakened the fighting spirit. It's about the entire world who's facing uh, these, these, these brutal policies. So we're not right now at the conference, but at the Blockupy protest against austerity. Many people here think that in the crisis, environmental issues are luxury concerns, but your position is rather different from that. Can you explain how you see the connection between capitalism, austerity, and the climate crisis? I think one of the failures uh, we've made, and I include myself in this as somebody who comes from the economic justice uh, movements as opposed to the environmental movements uh, for most of my life, is that I think we've really failed to make some very obvious connections between this existential crisis that humanity is facing in front of climate change and the daily economic concerns that so many people are engaged with in the face of austerity. Because if we take climate change seriously, if we listen to the scientists that are telling us that global emissions need to go down by 6% a year and in wealthy countries like Germany and Canada where I'm from, we need to be cutting our emissions by around 10% a year, then obviously that is completely incompatible with an austerity agenda. Because here we are living in countries where our governments are constantly telling us that we, ha that we have to cut back basic services, uh, where the public sphere is relentlessly under attack, and indeed where the very idea of collective action uh, is vilified. Um, it, if, we, if we take climate change seriously, first of all, it's the essence of a collective crisis. It requires unprecedented cooperation within our communities, within our countries, between our countries. Um, and also it, it requires massive investments in the public sphere, in the commons, reimagining it, reinventing it, and also shoring up parts of it. And that's in the face of the heavy weather that we've already unleashed, which we can't stop. So that's you know, what in climate jargon is called adaptation, what we, how we're going to respond to uh, increasingly intense storms and droughts. Um, but also, we have to get off fossil fuels in a big, big hurry, and that requires huge investments uh, in, in public transit. We need to make it free, first of all, so that's not compatible with the sort of austerity agenda that is telling the countries of Southern Europe to privatize their transit systems, for instance. Um, and we need to reimagine and, and invest massively in our energy systems so that we can move in very rapid uh, manner towards decentralized renewable energy. So none of this fits with the austerity agenda. And yet, we talk about climate change and austerity far too often as if these are separate issues and they have to be part of one holistic, organic conversation. I mean, so if, if we take a science-based approach to climate action, and we should, we know that we need to keep 80% of proven fossil fuel reserves in the ground. Um, the most urgent of, of, uh, of those fossil fuels is coal. The most urgent within coal is lignite coal, the dirtiest coal of all. Um, in Canada, you know, we're fighting against our form of extreme energy, which is the tar sands. But I think every geographic location has their extreme energy battle to fight. Now, if we lived in a sane world, our governments would be saying no to this massive expansion of the carbon frontier, but they're not. So we need leadership from below. We need to do what our governments aren't doing, which is say no. I mean, it's interesting having this conversation in Germany because Germany, I think, is one of the countries in the world that is doing the best job of saying yes to the kind of transition that we need. It's not perfect, but it's, it's, it's better than what we have in North America. But what you see in Germany very clearly is that 
it's not enough to say yes to the renewable energy programs that you want if you're not simultaneously saying no to the fossil fuel companies and saying you have to keep the carbon in the ground. Because look at, look at Germany's emission record. I mean, for a couple of years, emissions have been going up. Now they're going down marginally, but they're nowhere near where they need to be, which is going down by 8 to 10 percent a year. So we need to say yes to what we want, and we need to say no very forcefully to what we don't want. Yeah, I mean, in the book I describe Blockadia as this transnational resistance zone that is providing this leadership from below in the face of, of state failure. And the phrase Blockadia comes originally from the fight against the Keystone XL uh, pipeline in North America, um, where the southern leg of that pipeline was built by TransCanada, um, despite the fact that there was a, a big battle going on at the national level. Uh, well, it's sort of complicated, but the issue is there needed to be presidential approval to build a pipeline across the border between Canada and the U.S. because it becomes an international issue. But the company just went ahead and built the southern leg anyway. So in the face of that incredibly anti-democratic action, um, movements of, of a great coalition actually of cattle ranchers, indigenous people, anarchists, all kinds of environmental groups came together um, to block the construction of that pipeline and they called their encampment Blockadia. And that word, there's something about it, just started spreading around the movement and, and Blockadia started emerging wherever they tried to build the arteries to carry this extremely dirty energy. Um, and so I think Blockadia is a state of mind, really. It's not a place. Um, and, and, and really, even though the, the word comes from uh, the, the, the Keystone XL fight, I think that spirit deserves to be traced back to indigenous movements who've been fighting extreme extraction in their territory, um, really, since the, the earliest days of colonialism. But if we think about it in the context of fossil fuels, I think the originators of the Blockadia movement are the Agoni uh, in the Niger Delta, who kicked Shell out uh, in the 1990s, and Shell has yet to be able to return to that oil-rich land. Often when we fight in these place-based struggles, these, you know, the, these are choke points, right? These are, these are battles that really, really matter. There's a lot of carbon buried under the ground, and these, these are highly symbolic struggles, but they're also real struggles, because that's carbon that doesn't go into the sky if we win these battles, right? And there are these various choke points. You know, the tar sands is one. Um, you know, the, the, these big battles in Australia against open cast coal mining, bringing it through the, the Great Barrier Reef is another. Um, and this is an absolutely key one, I think, for, for, for many reasons, including the fact that Germany's energy transition has been so symbolic globally, but the weak point is coal. Um, so, you know, it, we need you to say no for a lot of reasons. We need you, we, you know, we need this transition to, uh, you know, to really work. Uh, we need the yes and the no woven together um, in a, 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 as something that we can really point to. And I think this also matters in the context of Blockadia um, because the German government has been prescribing austerity policies on all of Southern Europe that is forcing governments to drill for oil and gas, to build um, you know, more lignite coal mines and, and, and lignite burning uh, refineries. And yes, here we are at Blockify. This Blockadia. is a uh, very organic sound. Um, and, and so that, that's also why this matters, because if you can say no to lignite coal in Germany, then that also strengthens the movements all over Europe that are facing pressure from the German government, from German coal companies, to take your dirty energy and your dirty companies.